Are America's children addicted to praise? I'm Scott Ott, and this episode of Bill Whittle Now is brought to you by the members at BillWhittle.com. And let me just say this to our members. Good job. Way to go. You're so smart. Bill, um, there's a piece by a guy named Paul Underwood, a father of two out of Austin, Texas, in the New York Times, believe it or not, questioning the long-held doctrine, or at least held since the 1970s, about how important it is to express enthusiastic praise to your children over every little thing they do to build up their self-esteem. And basically, he's not saying that you should never praise your children, but the way you go about it is crucial. And one of the key focuses, and let me ask uh, you about this first, is the idea of praising a child for, for example, like I just said, you're so smart, versus praising something that they actually have control over, like you really worked hard on that. Uh, Bill, is this the proper remedy for what you've often said was a, a problem with uh, this generations of kids now who think that they should get a trophy for everything? Yeah, those punk kids with their music is just a bunch of noise. I wish they'd get <laughs> off my yard. Um, pants hanging down around their waist. Uh, no, seriously, you know, the the when you see the 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 um the emotionality and the and the the entitlement of of so many in that generation the millennial generation it, it's so hard to see and and i have to constantly and i'm not always successful in this restrain myself and say they didn't raise themselves these kids it's not their fault it's not their fault you want to know why they're socialists they're socialists because they've never ever had a chance to understand the connection between work and reward and by that, and you mean those who are socialists rather than damning the entire millennial generation. Needless to say, yes, the well, millennial generation it's not is needless to say. <laughs> uh, well, thank you. So so there you go. Um, but obviously, there are most of the military is millennials now and they're doing a magnificent job. Um, so. This this is the poison that has that has basically taken root. I've seen the whole thing. It's all happened in the course of my lifetime. Uh, the invention of paper happened in the course of my lifetime. And um, <laughs> and it's not fair to them. And they've been, they've been very terribly deprived. This is Here's what's wrong with the entire idea. Like everything else about progressivism, it, it has two qualities to it, this the self-esteem movement. One of them is it's fantasy. It'd be nice if it were true. And the other thing is it's lazy. When you put lazy and nice together, you have something that progressives will 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 basically flock to. Now the nice seems obvious, but what do you mean by lazy? It's lazy. It's easy. It 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 is it is a reflex that a parent can do uh, before he goes to work in the morning or when he comes out. Hey, oh, hey, how, how's it doing there, buddy? Oh, you, 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 and just laying all these platitudes on them. That is something you can do without thinking. It's a much harder thing to do to sit down and talk with your children, find out what they've done, what they're worried about, what challenges they face, what failures they've either met or are afraid of, help them with advice, but not do it for them, sit back and watch the process, dust them off when they fall down, but basically let them walk on their own. And when they have achieved a large goal or small, then you congratulate them, <coughs> excuse me, as you said, on, on their achievement, not on their innate magnificence. The problem, the, 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 the genuine problem with the self-esteem movement is that even the people who are subjected to it understand that it's not real. They know it. They, if every single thing you do is the most brilliant thing ever, even the dimmest child begins to realize that this is just plain not true. My parents are lying to me. Why are they lying to me? Well, they're lying to you because they don't love you enough to care about whether or not you're being told the truth. And if you have to be told some hard truths, then they're, they're just not willing to do it. And, and when I say they know you're lying, the best example of this I ever heard, it was a fragment of a sentence. I'd credit whoever wrote it if I could, if I could remember who did. But but somebody was talking about this idea that, well, we're not going to keep score during a baseball game because if we keep score, then the team that loses is going to suffer from low self-esteem and they won't be able to do as well next time. And the person who wrote this said, the adults aren't keeping score, the coaches aren't keeping score, the parents aren't keeping score, but you know who's keeping score? The kids are keeping score. They know what the score is exactly. And and it's not a question of depriving the winners of, of, of the results of their achievement. It's a question of depriving, of depriving the losers 
of a chance to understand that losing a baseball game is not, a Little League baseball game is not the end of the world. And you will get another chance to do it if you decide to go back into it. And better to learn that lesson at 11 than at 31, don't you think? One of the things that Underwood talks about, and by the way, in this article in the New York Times, he draws in a lot of uh, psychological studies and comments from other uh, people who are mental health or psychologists or psychoanalysts. Uh, But one of the things he talks about is how praising a child uh, creates sort of a missed placed focus. So instead of saying, hey, I enjoy doing artwork, for example, it's really more about how can I get the attention of my dad who will to get him to say something nice. And so the focus really is on pleasing the parent instead of enjoying the process of the artwork. And then uh, anytime that the praise doesn't come pouring out, that's an implied condemnation, which makes the right. kid, essentially, they said studies have shown the kids become kind of risk averse and they don't even want to try to do things because there's, number one, too much pressure up front to please the parent. And secondly, too much of a feeling of being, you know, sort of mentally crushed when the parent's not there with the praise. Perfect. It's like a, it's like a nicotine addiction. You get nothing but praise and the highest of accolades, no matter what you do. And, and therefore, anytime you aren't being told you're the greatest person in the whole wide world, then there's obviously something wrong with you and you get depressed. And as I said, they're not stupid. Kids, the entire idea of play, and especially competitive play like sports, is is to give kids a chance to not only socialize, but to understand what they're good at, what they're not at, whether or not they can compete in this particular area. It allows them to lose. It allows them to recover. The main thing about it is when you deprive these, when you deprive an entire generation of the chance to lose, you have deprived them of the chance to recover. You've deprived them of the chance to overcome. You've deprived them of the chance to succeed against odds. You've given, you've given them everything instantly, instant gratification. You have stolen from them the greatest single gift of happiness that can be bestowed on a person, which is the feeling you get when you work your tail off after reversal after reversal and you don't give up no matter how much you want to. When you finally succeed at that, there is nothing on the earth to match it. And and this is the problem with the self-esteem movement. They think that if you give people praise, then they'll accomplish great things, but it doesn't work that way. You have to accomplish the things first and then you get the praise. Let me give you a specific example from a study about this that was done actually back in 1998 that Underwood cites in his column in the New York Times. Um, There were two groups of children. Uh, The first group was uh, praised by saying, in effect, you're successful because you're smart. So something, an, an innate characteristic of the child. Group two was told, you're successful because you work hard. What they found is in further tests and uh, studies with those groups, the second group, the ones who were praised because they worked hard, chose more challenging problems to take on than the first group did. They enjoyed it more. And -hmm. if they failed at first to get it right, then they tended to power through to a solution. That description is the core of what made America a great country and and has continued to be a great country. That is, we are a self-selected group of individuals that are are inherent risk takers because the people who weren't willing to take a risk are still back in Russia or England or wherever with their scrawny little potatoes bowing their way out of the presence of the king. Um, Now, this is so destructive. it's so destructive and it's so awful and it's and it's just it just it cheats them and and it's not fair to them it deprives them and i don't know scott it, it's like what what other evidence do you need the 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 problem with look let me just i i got i got what i was trying trying to catch in my opinion the worst the most damning life that a child could well obviously without the exception of being kept in a garage or something for 30 years. But but in terms of your spiritual development, I have never seen a more unhappy group of people ever, and I've known a few of them, than trust fund babies, ever. I've never met anybody so miserable in my life. And these are the people, and the reason they're miserable is because think about the living hell of this. Imagine how awful your life would be if you got everything you wanted the instant you asked for it. People think, well, that'd be awesome. It'd be living hell. 
Living hell. Where would you go? What would you do? No wonder you're bored. No wonder you're self-destructive. No wonder you're looking for drugs or, or, or women or gambling or whatever to fill this gaping hole that exists because you never had a chance to rely on yourself and to achieve something. The, the, the worst fate imaginable for a first worlder anyway is to be given everything they want the second they want it and never ever have the feeling of having earned something. And I remember that feeling in multiple cases and it's unmatchable. And, and all of the stuff that follows downstream of that is, okay, we understand Re reward is, is connected to effort. And the harder I work, the more reward I'm gonna get. And I can fail because it's okay to fail because failing is not the end of the world. Failing is a lesson. Try again. This is, I've said a few times before, I think this is the seventh business that I've started. And I think number eight is gonna be successful. Um, but there it is. And, and so what you were talking about is, is just two different spirals, right? You've got the upward spiral of the kids who, who do difficult things and they succeed and their confidence grows. So they try even more difficult things. They succeed they even fail. more, their confidence grows higher. And they fail, yes. And then the other spiral is, well, I don't wanna risk it because I don't, you know, I'm, I'm always getting told how wonderful I am. And, 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 and then they're on a, a scale where they're just getting narrower and narrower and smaller and smaller. And the best thing I ever saw on this ever, 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 one of these little things that just changed my life was a Nike ad for Air Jordans. And it was Michael Jordan at, at his peak when he was simply, it was Michael Jordan and, and plus others. Um, and, and the ad basically had Michael Jordan's voiceover, and, and it was something to the effect of, during the course of my career, I've missed 3,422 shots that would have won the game. I, 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 you know, I, I could, just, just a list of all of the things he's done wrong. And it was a monumental list. He'd been playing a lot of basketball. And, and he ended up by saying, I fail and fail and fail, and that's why I succeed. And I thought, my God, put that on our money. It makes you wonder um, if we took the same approach that Paul Underwood is suggesting that the research shows uh, with, uh, with adults as we do with children. And uh, I'll finish with this. I mean, one of the things he said was, you know, praise, praise things that children have control over, not things that are inherent, obviously. So, you know, remark upon somebody's particular choices or their diligence or their attitude, or even say something like, wow, it looks like you really enjoyed that project, or ask them about their choices. You know, I see you put the, the brown crayon next to the purple crayon there. Can, why did you do that? And let them evaluate their own performance. Every child I found in a long uh, life of, you know, teaching children in uh, Sunday school and running a Christian children's camp, children don't think of themselves as goofy little characters who are running around playing. Children, when they are playing to us, are at work. And so if you respect the work and you ask them questions about the work and let them evaluate the work themselves, it develops uh, confidence. And this is just tangentially related, but I'll throw this in. I saw a kid at my store one day who came running up uh, with his parents and he was in the zone and he was, he was slinging webs around the store and he was crouched down and he was, you know, he was swinging from building to building and I could see all this happening. He was just a kid in jeans and a t-shirt. And he came leaping up next to me and landed next to me with his hands like this, like he was gonna fire some webs out there. And I looked down at him and I just said, good morning, Spider-Man. That's it, man. You made his day. Uh, you made his day. But I didn't say, uh, oh, isn't that precious? He's pretending no, you to didn't. be a cartoon you, 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 character. You, 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 you treated him like an adult. Uh, th there's a brilliant, really insanely brilliant series of reviews of the, uh, of the Star Wars first trilogy by a, a, a website, uh, a YouTube channel called Red Letter Media. And it's astonishingly brilliant stuff. And he's talking about The Phantom Menace, the, the first of the prequels, and the idea that George Lucas had was that, well, we got a lot of kids who like Star Wars, so why don't we put a kid into the fighter hmm. and they'll be able to identify with the kid. And then this guy said something I'll never forget. He said, but imagination doesn't work that way. Yeah. Little kids don't want to see little kids in fighter jets because they don't identify with them. What they want to see is Han Solo and people like that and Luke Skywalker because their imaginations connects themselves to the adult that they want to be. And, and when you deprive people of this, you've taken away a tremendously 
incredibly precious gift. Uh, it's funny you mentioned that, uh, the Spider-Man thing, because I was just thinking two days ago, I remember as I was a little boy, I would come home from school, I'd get into my little Batman outfit with my cape and my mask, I'd go stand down at the bottom of the driveway where, where uh, South Shore Road was in Bermuda, and I'd stand there with my hands on my hips and I'd protect the house, you know? And people would, would occasionally roll down their window and say, it's good to see you on the job, Batman. Mm -hmm. And I was like, as I, I was over the moon. And, and all of these rewards, they're endorphin hits, but they're the right kind of endorphin hits. When you said what parents should be praising children for, I, I think the, the last thing I'll say on this is you should also be praising them for their failures and especially praising them for their ability to recover from failure. The, if you have a child who has failed at something and they get back up and do it again, the praise they get for the effort of going back out there should exceed the praise that they get for having achieved the goal in the first place because that is the entire secret to life right there. Ladies and gentlemen, we are grateful for the members of BillWhittle.com who've made it possible for us to do this uh, through their sincere diligence, their caring, and frankly, the fact that they send money to this enterprise to make it possible for us to do this. Um, if you'd like to join that team, you will find great encouragement comes not from a bunch of uh, phony attaboy praise, but from just being around people who think through issues and who have a lot of fun doing it. We invite you to go to BillWhittle.com and click that big green Become a Member button find out what it's like. For Bill Whittle, I'm Scott Ott. Thanks for watching.